I'd like to thank uh, Robert Johnson and the other organizers for inviting me. Um, it's with some trepidation that a, that a mathematician comes to an audience like this. Uh, I spoke to, I think, three separate people last night that said to me some version of, aren't you the people that caused all this problem? Um, mathematicians work on many things, and I don't work particularly on finance, although some of the methods that I use, probability, optimization, networks, are similar to, to those that my colleagues use in the finance area. I work on networks primarily, and that's been a topic of interest to mathematicians for, uh, uh, productively of, in of interest to mathematicians for at least 150 years. It began in the 19th century, I, I could identify, with the work of essentially physicists on, on things like the network of molec molecules in this room. They bounce around, you can view them at the level of individual particles, attempting to assess their velocity, their momentum transfers. Uh, when you look at the aggregate pressure on the wall, that's an integral over space and time of momentum transfers between individual molecules in the wall. And descriptions such as Boyle's law, pressure, temperature, volume, those relationships are um, a different level of description, not inconsistent, and part of the work of mathematicians is to see the consistency between that macroscope description and the microscopic description. So I've been interested in this primarily in networks which have uh, been technologically constructed networks. So networks such as communication networks, phone networks, uh, the internet, or transport networks, road transport networks, or those sorts of networks. The interesting thing I think for them, for economists, is that the notion of an agent, the notion of uh, uh, some intelligence at least in the agents, is increasingly there. Indeed, some of the agents that we work with are arguably more clever at what they do than a human being would be. Uh, yet still, we see the problems that, uh, and, and perhaps especially so, we see problems of instability and hysteresis. So. Um, uh, I, I found a few slides on the, on the web, uh, and their copyright arrangements let me use them. So I'm going to do, use those slides to just indicate why people interested in financial networks uh, naturally think of networks. Then I'm going to talk about a problem that arises in communication networks and the other technological networks I described. It's a problem associated with resource pooling. And whether there's an, an, an analogy with one aspect of a problem of recent years in financial networks is I'd be interested in your views on. Uh, so this, these are the sorts of slides which make, make someone like me think, well, you know, this does look as if it's potentially interesting. This is from the science paper of Schweitzer et al. Um, this is from the Bank of England's financial stability website. This, these are the, uh, these banks, the, the, the nodes here are the banks, UK banks, and the strength of the link between them corresponds to um, the, the uh, amount of exposure of one bank to another. Uh, this is a slide from a paper uh, by uh, Robert May and co-authors, and uh, it's based uh, or relates back to earlier work of Guy and Capedia on contagion in financial markets. So it described for me a simple model of a bank, um, and I was quite struck by the similarity between this and models which arise very naturally in the study of telephony networks. Now you might say that's such a remote connection. How can that be? How can we get anywhere with that? But let, let me see. Let me simplify this a bit further. So this is my stylized idea of a bank balance sheet. And then what happens, it seems, I've learned in the last month or two, is that in fact the, the orange bits at the bottom are moving in and out. There are bits coming and bits being borrowed and not. Um, and that's happening on various time scales and at various sizes. Now that looks extremely that very similar, if I were to try and construct a model of that, it would look very similar to the sorts of models that have been familiar for about 100 years for telephony. And so I am going to have some equations now. I'm going to take a risk with this. So this is the very simple model of a, tel of a telephone exchange due to Erlang at the start of the 20th century. You suppose that there are C circuits on this link or out of a village. Calls arrive randomly at a rate A. And the rules are as follows. An accepted call holds a circuit for a random time, um, blocked calls are lost. And thus, the interesting question is, what is the proportion of calls that are lost? And how can you relate the, um, uh, if, if, if I'm told the capacity, how much average traffic could I sustain for a given loss rate? Or if I fix any one of three variables here, any two or three variables, what's the third one? That kind of question. What should be the capacity if I want to get a certain level of service? Um, so what I'm going to do next is describe uh, the work on this kind of model that has gone on in the last 30 years. 
uh, and, and lead into resource pooling. What's happened in the last 30 years? Well, what's happened in the last 30 years is that what were electromechanical exchanges have become uh, all-purpose computers. So these nodes here, if they want to send a call from this town to this town, they might have a first choice route that goes from here to here and then from there to there. And provided all the capacity constraints are satisfied, this is a representation of the capacity constraint on each of the links, then the call gets fitted in. But the obvious thing to do if it doesn't get fitted in along that link is to say, well, uh, why don't we try and route it along one of the other routes? Wouldn't that make sense? Maybe this route is broken. Um, and uh, that has been a driving force for the last 30 years. And it's been mainly successful after some false starts. Um, if you make a phone call from one point in the, uh, in, in the global network to another, uh, your chance of getting through, if you think about it, is higher than the chance that the components along the route are working. The end-to-end -end reliability of the telephone network is higher than of the components the components it's constructed from. And the telephony network is arguably, at the moment, the largest machine that, that the human race has constructed. Arguably, because the internet may be, in some senses, bigger now, with the same issues. So you make it reliable by, using, by pooling resources and using alternative routes. Uh, these were the sorts of things which were said in the 1970s to be what the aims of resource pooling should be. Uh, respond robustly to failures, lessen the impact of forecasting errors, make use of spare capacity, permit flexible use of network resources. It generally led to efficiencies that were measurable at the economic level for telephony companies. The problems, however, are instability and complexity. Uh, so, so to indicate a very simple toy model of how those instabilities can arise, uh, let's consider this. So this, um, the top tier of the UK phone network is about 50 or 60 nodes that are fully interconnected. It's a complete graph. Uh, and that's roughly the same for most industrialized countries. Um, and let's suppose that all links have the same capacity. And suppose we make the following rule. A call is routed directly when it arrives, if possible. Otherwise, one randomly chosen alternative route may be tried. So if a call wants to go from there to there and gets blocked on the direct link, it might, for example, choose this tandem node, as it's called, at random, and it attempts to be fitted in there and there. If it can be, it is, and if it can't fit in there, it's thrown away. It doesn't try anything else. That was studied extensively in the uh, beginning in the 70s and 80s, um, and one of the simple models for it is as follows. Um, if you think of that earlier formula, Erlang's formula, then you can work out what physicists would call a mean field approximation or a cavity uh, approximation for a uh, cavity method equation for this. Um, and in the early 70s, it was discovered that that equation there has multiple roots. Nakagomi and Mori discovered that in 73. And they wrote in their paper, and this was agreed with, with almost everyone else that commentated on, that this must be an artifact of the model, because we don't see it happening in our tele telephone network. Well, they did. Five years later, it started to happen. It happened in the AT&T network in the early 80s. It happened in the French data network in the mid-80s. One after, it happened in the global network, uh, telephone network at the time of a fire in Australia when lots of people were trying to call from the UK. Um, one after the other, the instabilities that this led, that equation described happened. If you try and solve the equation, you get these multiple routes for certain capacities. So as the load increases, there are multiple solutions to the equation. At first, it was thought this was an artifact of the model, but we now understand that it describes the model very well, describes the reality of networks very well. If you increase the load gradually, so suppose I follow the yellow curve along here, I, the, the, the blocking probability increases slowly, but it gets to a point where it suddenly jumps to a high level. And if you carry on increasing, it carries on up here. If you lower the uh, load, it doesn't drop back where it jumped up. It goes back to the uh, vertical part of the curve here and then drops down. So the, there's a hysteresis effect that the uh, blocking within the network depends upon the, the, the past, how it got to where it, where it got. This phenomenon is familiar in all sorts of uh, large networks. It'll be familiar to you if you drive on a, motor, a congested motorway. When you get to that stop-go traffic, uh, uh, what's going on is that you're it's, it's, it's almost, there's, a, there's an analogous theory here, and you're stuck in the top branch. An intuition for this is as follows, that 
at certain traffic loads, there are three states, the middle one's unstable, the upper one and the lower one are, uh, are metastable states. The lower one has low blocking, most calls are routed directly, and people are generally happy. However, it's possible to be in another metastable state where calls arrive and a good proportion of those are blocked on their first choice route. They try a two-link route, and worst of all for the network, they get in on that two-link route because that will use two circuits for the lifetime of that call. And so if, for example, you were to ask over the lifetime of, of, of that call, do either of those links become full and cause another call to try a two-link route, you'll see that there's a potential branching process branching out there. Now, whether the branching process is super or subcritical depends on the load, and as the load on the system varies, the tree and the branching process can, whoops, goes from subcritical to supercritical. Uh, so that's the sort of phenomenon uh, that this is, a, this is a, uh, a simple simulation of it. You may see it stuck in this state for a while and then jump to this state. One has to simulate this with a very small number of nodes because if the number of nodes becomes large, then the time you spend in this state or this state can grow to be the uh, length of the universe quite quickly. Right, so. um, What's going on with, a point I want to make here is that the agents in these models are identical and predictable. I told you the rules. They're also in some local decentralized sense, rational. If you can't get in on the direct route, to attempt a two-link route is rational from the point of view of uh, attempting to, to carry the traffic. And it's important in these networks that the decisions be decentralized. The, the time lag, speed of light even time lags in the internet are so long that you cannot rely on collecting system information, even if you could deal with the complexity and comp uh, of computing with it. Nonetheless, even though the agents are identical and predictable, bistability nonetheless arises. Even with minimal thinking elements, even with minimal amounts of thought, it's possible to generate models with bistability and hysteresis. Um, it's hard to predict quite what the onset of, uh, of, of, of the instability is. If you imagine road traffic, for example, um, just if you look at the data for the M25, just before flow breakdown happens at 7.30ish in the morning, the amount of traffic going along it is just reaching a critical level. Some mornings it gets above the critical level, they manage to drive very carefully and no, no one puts their foot on the brake or whatever, and they manage to keep above the, um, the, the theoretical maximum for as long as I found one day it was 45 seconds, right? Essentially, it's, it's as if you've supercooled water. If water's pure and you, re you reduce its temperature below zero, it may not freeze. But the least imperfection will, will cause a crystal to grow. Um, and so to, to, to try and identify the cause of the traffic jam or the cause of the instability, well, historically, you can find the branching process that went supercritical, but one of them will do. If it wasn't that one, it would have been another one. Um, the example I've given is one where the, um, there's an amplification effect because when a call is alternatively routed, it uses more capacity. Um, and I suppose an obvious question for banking networks is whether, as people, wh whether there is any amplification essentially as part of the system. Um, even without amplification, the following is an issue for resource pooling. Imagine that I had a set of um, parallel resources, and if I couldn't use my first choice one, I used another one, and there was no increase in the, in the, in the raw capacity used, so there was no amplification effect. Then resource pooling would still have the, the, the following phenomenon, and this is uh, the control mechanisms that are introduced into networks to deal with the problem I've just described reduces it to this problem, where the amplification problem is dealt with. Right? That's the first thing one has to deal with, to prevent that amplification. But once one's dealt with that, one has this problem, that as you pool more and more resources, the um, curve giving you the amount of pain you feel. Pain is the feedback signal. In, 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 in the internet, it's loss of packets or delay. In, in economic models, it's often price. But for my purpose, it's simply a feedback signal. Um, that feedback signal with no pooling increases slowly as you increase the load up to capacity. It increases here because we're dealing with essentially stochastic systems. And so even when you're below capacity, then uh, you, will, you will suffer some pain. 
As you increase pooling, you find you move to the right here. This looks great sense for the router or for the runner of the network. It looks like at any given capacity that he's given to run his network, the best thing to do is to go for the green curve rather than the yellow one rather than the red one. Right? The problem is that the department within uh, road planning or internet planning that is doing the routing doesn't realize the problem it's creating for the department that's doing capacity planning. Because what happens here is that if the demand, the, the, the load itself is uncertain rather than just uh, random, um, as it always is, then this gives no indication along here that you're approaching capacity. And the lo locally, it's extremely hard to tell from local observations whether you are increasing capacity. So this is my final slide. Uh, a problem that arises in any of these areas, road traffic networks, um, uh, communication networks, to some extent electrical power networks, is that resource pooling does indeed do all these great things that it was planned to do. But it can produce phase transitions if load is amplified and it obscures the approach of capacity overload. So a challenge in things like uh, in planning uh, the control mechanisms and the capacity planning mechanisms for the internet and for telephony networks is can you combine decentralized control with local information, very, very noisy local information, decisions being made with local incentives, can that be combined with some system-wide measures that may well be a much slower time scale, much less detailed, that can indicate that the branching processes that the decentralized control is necessarily constructing, that those branching processes will tend to have subcritical behavior. I'll stop.